describe John? Oh, wow. That's like trying to describe an enigma. Um, <laughs> he's the most loving, creative, interesting man I have met in my entire life. And I'm just really fortunate to be his partner. It's, it's been a wonderful life. It's, it's a difficult journey, and I think any caregiver, spouse, um, will tell you um, this is probably one of life's most difficult chapters. John Ilvesacker was born in Fargo, North Dakota in 1937. Carl, John's father, was the Dean of Education and a religion professor at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. With a passion for religion and music, Carl recruited students at a variety of church camps. It was at these camps that John developed his love for music and the Word of the Lord. As a young boy, John spent much of his time with his father being exposed to the traditions of folk music and the stories of the Bible. The father-son duo also attended camps together until Carl's death at the age of 49, leaving John, then a seven-year-old boy, to be cared for by his mother. As he grew older, John sought to follow his father's footsteps by pursuing a career as a musician. Music is a universal language. Muse is the word that it comes from. And the muse is sort of a spiritual communicator of ideas and emotions. John continued his involvement with the church by writing spiritual songs for youth gatherings as well as paraphrasing scripture for musical use. His musical endeavors led him to many church gatherings, including a retreat where he first encountered the woman that would soon transform his life. That woman was Fern Kruger. A powerful friendship was formed and the two kept in contact after the retreat. I, I had also offered to be his friend and initially he misinterpreted that and thought that... I called her a groupie. Yeah, he <laughs> called me groupie, which is another word that I had never heard of at the time. And so I said, you'll have to define that for me. And when he did, I was really offended. So then I tried to slap his face, and he... I still have a well. No, you, no, you, you caught my hand, but uh, I, I basically said, you obviously have not had a friendship because that's, um, that's what I'm offering you is friendship. Fern stayed true to that friendship as John's career continued to grow. At the time, John worked as a producer for a new radio show for the American Lutheran Church. The ALC was his home for 15 years, and over the course of that time, he committed himself to sharing the stories of God through hymns and songs. In 1987, the ALC joined the Lutheran Church in America to form what we now know as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, or the ELCA. The merger resulted in the closing of the media center, and that left John crushed, struggling to find direction, and questioning his very existence. So I was losing my job, losing my family, losing my not knowing what was going to happen to myself after I hit my 49th birthday, which was the year my dad was age he was when he died. And I was battering my life after him, pretty much. And all, all of this just kind of came crashing down. One night, it was too cold. So I grabbed a, a sleeping kind of a pad thing from the truck and went into the I still had a way to get into the, center, the media services center. And I went in, lay down in the back control room, and I lay down and slept. 
And all of a sudden there was a, a light, light went on. I thought, oh no, the guy's here. My clock didn't work. And he turned the light on. But I looked at the door and the door was still shut. And there's no windows in the room. And so I, I was on my back. I just shot up like this. And I saw this image at, at, on the, against, against the wall on the other side. It's kind of like a hologram, you know. You know what I mean? Holograph. And, uh, but it was very bright. And I, it was a figure of, of an individual that I then thought I could talk to. So I said, I think we need to talk. And the figure answered, saying, what do you need to talk about? And I said, my heart is so full, it's bursting out, and I'm afraid it's going to be the death of me. And the figure said, well, why don't you empty it? And I said, well, how? You can give it to me. And I said, well, what, what, what will you do with it? And the figure said, I will cover it. And I said, with what? And the figure said, with blood. Blood? Well, so I, then I started marching out all the pain, all the grief and all the sin and all the anguish and all the stuff that I was carrying around. And I, I, I emptied it out. And I said, well, now there's lots of room in there. Do you want to come in? I don't know why I said that. And the figure said, sure, and disappeared. Now I got up out of there in time and went for a long walk, showed up at the seminary, which is just up at the top of the hill. And a good friend of mine was there, and I, wanted, I told him the story. And he was a psychologist, and he said he wouldn't touch it. He couldn't handle that. So I drove all the way down here and found Fern, and I knew she would listen to it. I'm a good listener. Um, I read body language very well, but I'd say Trained that I, social worker Well, with one client. <laughs> but I would say, too, that, that I'm also very direct. Um, and that is my counseling style too. But at the time, I would say even in friendships, um, my friends would tell you, I just call it as I see it. And, and I believe in going through life just facing things head on. And so that's what I encouraged John to do. Um, he wasn't used to dealing with difficult feelings or difficult issues. And I just wouldn't let him hide. I just would go after him. You know, it's like I couldn't just talk to anybody about my psychological situation. And Fern was one person that I knew I could talk to and it would be a safe place. The loss of his job left John homeless. He took shelter in his van and began his journey on the road expressing himself through lyrics and composing music from raw emotions. He traveled coast to coast, sharing his faith through music in local churches and coffee shops. But he never forgot about Fern, and he always made sure to stop to visit her as he passed through the Midwest. It was during those visits that their relationship began to strengthen and evolve. 
Fern's nurturing spirit was something John had never felt or experienced before in any other relationship. However, John's mental state continued to deteriorate, and Fern, who was still married to her ex-husband, became his main support system. I, I, I received um, a, a letter from him that indicated um, that he was in pretty bad shape psychologically, emotionally. And so I immediately, after reading it, I, I got very concerned. I called him and said, are you in as bad a shape as this indicates? And he said, worse. And I, it, it so happens, I didn't have classes the next day. Um, I said, I insist on meeting you in Rochester. That would be halfway for both of us. Um, and again, I was still, I was married to Tony at the time. I, uh, I told Tony, you know, John is in very difficult circumstances. You know, I need to go to Rochester tomorrow and meet with him. I basically just sat there and listened, but this was that year that was really traumatic for him. Um, he was having a lot of losses. I just sat and listened. I really didn't do anything. But before we parted company that day, he said to me, you're God's love incarnate to me. Their relationship is one built on trust. With both coming out of unhealthy marriages, it was a struggle for John and Fern to erase the scars of their past. But in 1991, they embraced the strength of their relationship and were married at an informal wedding. I think initially, too, I was testing John because I, I really didn't feel, I mean, I, I was still struggling with, can I really trust another man? I, because I had come out of an abusive marriage. And so I, I, I kept saying, you know, he was always so kind and so loving. And I, it's like, I was like, are you real? You know, it just, <laughs> it just didn't seem like um, anybody could be like that. But... Um, and I was saying, this is the real me. That was not the real me. This is the real me. And I believed it. It was a valuable lesson to learn. John continued to travel the country, performing music for churches and gatherings. But this time, John's trips were different. He now had Fern by his side. The couple traveled the country together for more than 17 years, and in that time, their love and faith continued to grow. We actually get along extraordinarily well, given the amount of time we spend together. Um, other married couples have said, there's no way I could spend that much time with my spouse. <laughs> um, we'd kill each other, you know, but um, John and I remained still best friends. We did really well. Yeah, yeah, we did. It's, um, it's, it's like so many other spouses. It's just, um, it's just difficult when you're having to face the prospect of the journey coming to an end. Um, and uh... In 2004, John was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The news turned their lives upside down, and soon doctors' appointments and health discussions took over the days that used to be filled with music and travel. While battling this cancer, John was also diagnosed with prostate and skin cancer. However, John's doctor suspects this will not be what takes his life, but rather he will pass away from multiple system atrophy. Through it all, they both continue to remain positive, and count their blessings each day. And yet we trust. I, we, we get up every day and um, <laughs> John will frequently greet the day with, got another one, Fern. And um, so then we decide what what are we going to do with this gift of this day that we have? We have one more day together. So um, let's figure out how we're going to use that. Um, and, uh, 
you uh, you learn to be kind and patient and uh, perhaps more loving uh, if that's possible. Um, just grateful, very, very grateful for each day that we have. But the thought of death is always at the back of their minds. Each night, before going to bed, John and Fern tell each other, I love you, because another day is not promised. And, but we, we really live one day at a time, and we know when we say good night to each other that we may not see each other again, because there's a very high risk that John will stroke in his sleep. Typically, when he'd wake up in the morning, he'd say, Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Um, you know, Welcome or, to my life. Or if he's laying in, a, in the times, the rare occasions when he would get really sick and I would be kind of hovering and checking on him and everything. And I say, you know, and he was always so grateful, you know, and for everything that I would do for him. And I said, how can you be so pleasant? Because I'm, I get grumpy. I do not do sick well. She, and she has a low pain threshold. I don't know if it's a pain threshold. I just don't like being sick. Uh, and I get grumpy. So, but he's always kind and pleasant, no matter what. And so I said, how do you do that? You know, and he said, well, I just lay here and list all the things that I'm grateful for. And what we've experienced is, is like John had said earlier, you know, God's love incarnate, really, in our own relationship. And um, so we're just immensely grateful for every day and for whatever comes. Um, we see God in the eyes of people, mm -hmm. including you.